The Lamp from the Warlock's Tomb by John Belairs, Chapter 6. Half a week dragged past. Each day after school, Anthony raced off to the library to find out if Miss Eels had any news. But each time that Anthony asked, Miss Eels said that she hadn't heard a thing from Emerson, who had driven up to Stillwater to check out Mr. Swigert's farm. Nothing, not a peep, not even so much as a phone call. However, she said she was not ready to push the panic button yet. Emerson was a strange and infuriating person, and he liked to keep people waiting until he was ready to give them his exciting news. Finally, on Friday evening, Emerson returned. He was cheerful and fairly bubbling over with enthusiasm because he had found out that the mound was practically unguarded. There was no electric fence. There was no grinning guard dog. Breaking in would be a cinch, an absolute pushover. Miss Eel sat in her office listening to her brother's breathless report. Emerson was perched on a stool next to the desk, and Anthony was sitting in an armchair in a corner. It was 9.30, and the library had been closed for half an hour. One would have thought that Miss Eels would be overjoyed to hear what Emerson had to say, but instead she seemed puzzled and upset. M, she said at last when he paused to catch his breath. I'm a little bit confused. You say that there aren't any problems about getting into the tomb. The place is just wide open, waiting for us to go up and burrow into the hill and put the lamp back where it belongs. But if everything is so wonderful and hunky-dory, why did you stay up in Stillwater for three days? Emerson grimaced. I didn't have much choice in the matter, sister dear. My car burned out of bearing, and I had to wait until the guy at the local garage could order the part and have it installed. But now I think we are ready to get moving. Anthony, do you think you could get your science teacher to unlock his lab so we can get the lamp tomorrow morning? I know it's a Saturday, but maybe you could make up some reason for... I think it'll be okay, said Anthony, interrupting. Mr. Cardwell usually works there on Saturdays. He feeds the lab animals and messes around with experiments. I'll call him up tomorrow morning and see if he'll let us in. Early on Saturday morning, Miss Eels, Emerson, and Anthony were standing outside one of the side doors of Hoosack High School. Through the glass panels, they saw a tall, lean man with a leathery tanned face. He held a ring of keys and looked rather puzzled, but he smiled politely as he opened the door. I hope we're not causing you a lot of trouble, Mr. Cardwell, said Miss Eels as they walked past him. But I'm sure Anthony must have told you I do need the lamp that you're keeping for him. We're having an antiques exhibit at the library on Monday, and Mrs. Oxenstern will have a fit if everything isn't just so when the exhibit opens. Mr. Cardwell winced. He was well acquainted with the bossy woman who was the head of the library board. I get you, Miss Eels, he said with a grim little chuckle. The visitors followed Mr. Cardwell to the chemistry lab. Out came the key ring again. The teacher unlocked the closet door, which creaked as he pulled it open. I'll get it for you, Mr. Cardwell said as he stepped into the closet. It ought to be right behind this big jug of... His voice trailed away as he stopped dead in his tracks. Quietly, Anthony peered over the teacher's shoulder into the dark corner where he had put the box that held the lamp, but the box was gone. Anthony stepped back into the room and threw a frightened glance at Emerson and Miss Eels. Meanwhile, Mr. Cardwell anxiously moved jars and bottles around. There was a long, tense silence while Mr. Cardwell searched until finally he heaved a disinterested sigh and turned his face to his visitors. He looked very embarrassed and unhappy. I'll be darned if I know what happened to the thing, Mr. Cardwell muttered as he shook his head. I remember very well seeing Anthony put that box in behind the sulfuric acid jug, and nobody has a key to this closet except me. How on earth could... Mr. Cardwell's hand flew to his mouth. A thought had just occurred to him. Turning, he walked to the back of the closet and started up the ladder that was bolted to the wall. Anthony had seen the ladder before, but he hadn't thought about it much. Now as he watched, Mr. Cardwell put his foot on one of the lower rungs and started to climb. When he reached the ceiling, he raised his fist and thumped at a panel of wood that was set in the ceiling. Then he pushed the panel back. Daylight flooded into the closet. Ha! I thought so, growled Mr. Cardwell. This trap door should be, should be hooked from the inside, but it isn't. Somebody got up onto the roof of the school and came in this way to steal the lamp. Pretty darn clever. Miss Eels turned pale, and she grabbed Emerson's arm. Anthony knew what they were thinking. The lamp wouldn't be very valuable in itself. No one would go to the trouble of stealing it unless he knew the lamp was magic. Gently, Emerson pried his sister's fingers loose from his arm. Then he took off his jacket and handed it to her. Here, sis, he said. 
Hold this for me while I go have a quick scamper across the roof of this notable institution. He turned and glanced quickly at Mr. Cardwell. You don't have any objection? I, objections, I hope? Mr. Cardwell shook his head. No, go right ahead. As the others watched, Emerson climbed nimbly up the, la nimbly up the ladder and wriggled out through the trap door hole. Five minutes passed until Emerson reappeared. Humming quietly to himself, he climbed back into the room and took off his and took his jacket from Miss Eels. Did you find anything? asked Anthony anxiously. Not a great deal, muttered Emerson as he put his jacket back on. There's a loose trap door over on the other side of the roof. I lifted it and peered in. Seems to be a storeroom of some kind. You really ought to speak to the janitor, Mr. Cardwell. This business of leaving trap doors unhooked all over the place. It's not a good idea, Mr. Cardwell scowled. It hasn't been a problem until now, he said. I mean, we never had a break in at Hoosack High before, and I'll be darned if we can, if I could see why this one happened. Was the lamp really worth a lot of dough? Miss Eels gave Emerson an odd look, and then she forced a smile. Fortunately, no. It isn't very uh, valuable, she said, hemming and hawing a bit. But it uh, had a good deal of um, sentimental value to me. You know how these things are. Mr. Cardwell stared at Miss Eels curiously. Sentimental value, he said in a wondering tone. Anthony told me that you bought the thing down in Drebish just a little while ago. How could you get sentimental about it in that length of time? Miss Seals' face was getting red. Well, uh, did I use the word sentimental? She asked, waving her hand in a flustered way. How foolish of me. I meant that it uh, had a good deal of uh, charm value. Yes, that's what I meant to say. It was utterly charming. What with that Dutch china base and all those cute little uh, Dutch pictures. You know what I mean. My sister is not always terribly precise in her speech, said Emerson dryly. But to return to important matters, as far as I can tell, the only people who knew the lamp was here are the four of us. Isn't that so, Myra? Miss Eels nodded. I suppose so. I certainly didn't tell anybody else. Did you, Anthony? Nope. I don't think I even told my mom or dad or brother. Or brother Keith about it. I wonder who swiped it. Miss Eels thanked the chemistry teacher for being so patient. And then the three visitors left. When they were back inside Emerson's car, Miss Eels let out a string of very fancy curse words. She was angry and frightened and very frustrated. I know how you feel, Myra, said Emerson as he lit his meerschaum pipe. This is a very puzzling business. The bloody lamp is haunted, and I cannot for the life of me see why anyone would want to take it. I mean, it would be like stealing a poisonous plant or a chunk of radioactive material. Of course, the ghost might have, the ghost might have stolen it, but... Then why didn't he do it earlier, when the lamp was in Mrs. Grimshaw's shop? Actually, if the ghost really did take it, which I doubt, he wouldn't have needed to pop in through the trap door, would he? I still do not see what good the lamp would do the ghost or anybody. That is the thing that is really driving me crazy. Why was the lamp stolen? Maybe we have a mad lamp collector in our midst, said Miss Eels with a grim chuckle. She paused and scratched her chin. I have to admit that the whole business has me stumped, she went on, but I do think we can be certain about one thing. If the thief is fool enough to light the lamp, he'll be very, very sorry, and we'll be reading about another ghostly murder in the newspapers. I wish I thought that the thief was a fool who didn't know about the powers of the lamp, said Emerson as he puffed his pipe meditatively. If I thought that, I wouldn't be so nervous, but I have the horrible feeling that the thief is a very clever person who knows a lot more than we do. What do you think the thief knows? asked Anthony anxiously. Emerson shrugged helplessly and said nothing. After a few days, Emerson went back up to St. Cloud, and Miss Eels and Anthony returned to their normal everyday routine. Winter plodded on, with wintry gales and a heavy snowfall. Every day when he went out to get the morning paper, Anthony expected to read about a murder that was somehow connected to the haunted oil, with the with a haunted oil lamp, but the deaths were the usual ones reported in the picturesque style of the Hoosack Daily Sentinel. If somebody important died, the Sentinel would have a short article with a heading like "Mrs. Ethel Odegaard succumbs" or "Death claims T. R. Creech." But there were no articles about bodies turned to with to withered papery husks. No magic lamps had been seen hovering through the mists along the Mississippi River. Nevertheless, the mystery of the lamp stayed on Anthony's mind, and on Miss Eels' mind, too. 
To make themselves feel better, they tried to find out as much as they could about Willis Nightwood, the sinister old man who had built the Scarecrow's tomb up in Stillwater, Wisconsin. But there wasn't an awful lot to find out. Willis Nightwood had not been famous. <clears throat> he had just been weird, and there weren't any books about him. The Seals phoned the public library in Stillwater, and the librarians had a copy of the article that appeared in the local paper on the day Mr. Nightwood died. From the article, Miss Seals found out a few things that she hadn't known before. She learned that Mr. Nightwood had built a large, elaborate summer house on, the, on an island in Stillwater Lake, and she also learned that he had left a large collection of legal books which were sold by his relatives. Some of these books wound up in the public library in Hoosack, where Anthony and Miss Seals worked. It's not much to go on, said Miss Seals, <clears throat> after she told Anthony what she had found out. But I suppose it's better than nothing. The next time you have a few spare moments, go to the legal section in the stacks and see if you can find any books with a book plate or signature that says Willis Nightwood. Anthony looked blank. What do I do then? Miss Seals smiled mischievously. Why bring them to my office? Then, after everyone has gone home, we will go over these books with a fine-tooth comb. We will rip the pages loose from the bindings and tear apart the covers to see if anything is sewn up inside. I'm a librarian, and I don't much like destroying books. But if I can find one little teeny tiny clue that will help us solve the mystery we have on our hands, it will be worth it. That evening, after the library closed, Anthony came to Miss Seals' office with three dusty volumes bound in black pebbled grained leather. Each one had a book plate pasted on the inside of the front cover, and the book plates all said, Ex Liberus Willis Nightwood. As Anthony watched, Miss Eels solemnly shook each volume, but nothing fell out, not even a dead moth. Then she took a penknife and sliced through the spine of each book. She ripped the moldy leather away from the stiff cardboard covers of the book and peered till her eyes were sore, but she found nothing, absolutely nothing. A week passed. On a snowy night in December, Anthony and his family were sitting in the living room in front of the television set. They were watching the Jackie Gleason show, a program that Anthony loved. He was always running around the house imitating Jackie's struts and saying, And away we go! He was a bit irritated when the phone rang just as Reggie Van Gleason III was going into one of his routines. Can you get it, Ma? He asked grumpily. I really want to watch this. So do I, his mother shot back. And if I remember correctly, I answered the phone three times during television shows last night, and each time it was for you. We ought to just take the hook, up, the phone off the hook during this show, growled Keith, Anthony's older brother. Well, why don't you go get it? Come on. Meanwhile, the phone went on ringing. At last, wearily, Anthony pushed himself to his feet and stumbled into the dining room where the phone was. He pulled the sliding door shut and picked up the receiver. It was Miss Eels, and she was really in a state. Anthony, hello, is that you? Oh, good, I was so afraid that you'd be out. Listen, I just got the strangest phone call from Adele Grimshaw. She called to tell me that she had some information about the lamp, and she wants me to come out to, come out to her place. Why didn't she just tell you over the phone, asked Anthony. I suggested that, but she wouldn't hear of it. Anthony, you have no idea how nervous that woman was. She was practically crawling out of her skin, and half the time she didn't sound like herself at all. She was really upset. Miss Eels paused and sighed. Of course, I will admit, she went on, that this so-called information may be something that Adele dreamed up on her own. But I feel that I have to go. I wonder if you'd care to ride along with me. Anthony stifled a groan. Tomorrow was Sunday, and in the morning he was planning to play baseball with Ted Hoopenbecker and some other boys down at the high school gym. But the mysterious disappearing lamp had been on his mind a lot, and if Mrs. Grimshaw had any news about it, he wanted to know. Besides, he was afraid of letting Miss Eels go into a dangerous situation by herself. For all he knew, the lamp thief might be lurking around out at Miss Grimshaw's place. If anything bad happened to Miss Eels, Anthony would never forgive himself. Okay, I'll come, he said after a long pause. What time do you want to pick me up? It was a bright, clear, wintry morning when Miss Eels and Anthony started off toward... Dresbach. Snow glittered on the high bluffs above the Mississippi, and river barges hooted as their car rolled past. On the way, Miss Eels talked a blue streak. She babbled about everything under the sun, her feud with Mrs. Oxenstern, the price of Royal Dalton China, and the trouble she was having with the kids who threw spitwads in the East Reading Room. Anthony could not get a word in edgewise. 
He knew Miss Eels pretty well, and he knew that she was extremely nervous. Finally, when she had paused to catch her breath, he spoke. Miss Eels, what are you so antsy about? Do you think going to see that woman is going to be dangerous? Miss Eels looked startled, and she laughed. You are getting to be a very perceptive young man. If you really want to know, I'm very nervous about this trip. I don't like the way Adele sounded over the phone. I really can't imagine what she has to tell me, but when we get there, try to act calm, or she'll have a conniption right before our eyes. Let me do the talking, okay? Anthony nodded. When they arrived in Dresbach, they cruised through the tiny downtown section and then turned off onto a steep st side street that led to Mrs. Grimshaw's antique shop. Over the bare trees rose the couple of the fancy old Victorian house. Miss Eels nosed her car into the parking lot and shut off the motor. When they opened the door, they saw that there was no one in either of the two big downstairs rooms. The house was silent. A strong smell of burning kerosene hung in the air. Hello, Adele, Miss Eels called when she reached the bottom of the main staircase. Are you home? No answer. She's probably in her office in the back, muttered Miss Eels. Come on. Anthony followed Miss Eels down a narrow back hall to a paneled door that stood slightly ajar. Peering in, Anthony saw a tiny room that held a roll-top desk littered with bills and other papers. A floor lamp stood nearby, and beyond it was a set of shelves built into the far wall. The shelves held broken mechanical antiques, cast iron banks, clocks, and a couple of music boxes. Pulled up to the desk was a swivel chair, and in it sat something that made Anthony's eyes open wide. At first, he thought it was a white plaster statue, a statue dressed in Mrs. Grimshaw's clothes and fitted with a wig that looked like Mrs. Grimshaw's hair. The figure was hunched over the desk, and it gripped a pen in its chalky fingers. As Anthony and Miss Eels watched in frozen horror, the strange shape turned and stared at them, and they saw that living human eyes burned in its head. The pale mouth opened, and the figure dissolved. It fell to pieces before their eyes, and there was nothing left but a sagging empty dress and a whitish powder that ran out across the floor and then lay in a whispering, drifting heap at their feet. And that is the end of chapter 6.